Good evening. It's good to see you again with us this afternoon, and I'm glad that you're all here. Well, there's a misconception in the world today. A poll has been done recently, and uh, I'm going to give you the um, accounts for that poll here in just a moment. The poll was about heaven and hell, and the people were asked, do you believe in heaven? And do you believe in hell? Both, both sides. The majority want to believe in heaven. But by the same token, there's a great majority that don't want to believe in hell. They like the good aspect of it. They don't like the bad. The numbers are 34%. 34% of our population do not believe that there is a hell. By the same token, only 58% believe that there is. There's 8% out there still haven't made up their mind. So, this is not a good thing. People don't want to believe in punishment. There are a lot of people who like to think, well, we're going to be punished, yes. You know, God's going to punish those that don't believe or don't obey, but... It's not going to be for all eternity. They're just going to be punished for a little while, and then they'll just go ahead and die and vanish away. That's like that's what they want to think of. They don't want to think of it as an everlasting type of punishment. But by the same token, we need to have a standard that we go by. What do we go by? What do we believe? Now I've entitled this morning's, or, I'm sorry, this evening's lesson. Christopher was over here saying this morning, and that's throwing me off. And this evening's lesson is entitled The Eternity of Hell. The Eternity of Hell. Hell is eternal because, first of all, the Bible clearly says that it is. If we're going to have a standard, we're going to have a truth we go by, then that's the one we're going to measure all things by. Number two, the same words that are used to describe eternity of hell are used to describe the eternity of heaven. Same words. We're going to go over those some and look at them. Number three, God's justice, His righteousness, demands that the consequences of hell be eternal. His righteousness, His justice demands that. Okay? Now let's look at these briefly. First of all, the Bible states that hell is eternal. Now, if we're going to believe in the Bible, we're going to believe in God, therefore we're going to believe in heaven and hell, we're going to believe what the Bible says about heaven, about God, and of course about hell. We're going to have, we can't just pick and choose what we want to believe and, and leave part of it out, just because we don't like that. The world loves to do that. The place of hell is eternal. Look in Jude chapter 1, verse 13. Jude chapter 1, and verse 13. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Wandering Stars, blackness uh, of darkness forever. What do we know about darkness? The hell is called outer darkness. There is no light because God is not present there. God is light. Where God is, there is light. Where God is not, there is darkness. It's a darkness that. If you look and study the terminology used to describe the darkness, it's a darkness that you can feel. It's, there is no visual acuity whatsoever. Revelation 20, verse 10. Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and the brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's not hard to understand that, is it? Forever and ever. 
Look up those words in the original Greek. And you'll find that there's for the time specified, for all eternity, for eons. Eons are for a great expanse of time. But we know that when the Lord returns, there is no more time. Time, as we know and understand time, the 24-hour day, the little ticks on the clock and the seconds passing by, that ends. There is no more time. So what's left if there is no more time? What was in the beginning? That's eternity. So if the time ends, then there is no more time. So if that's the case, then only eternity remains. Okay? So if there's a place that exists, then you're in that frame of reference of eternity, then it is an eternal place. That's common sense. The punishments that take place in hell, the punishments are eternal. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 12. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and gather his wheat into the garden, but he will burn up the chaff with Unquenchable fire means the fire here it goes out. An eternal fire. Mark chapter 9, 43 and 44. Mark chapter 9, 43 and 44. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. How much more clear can God make? Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse nine. The wicked in hell will be there eternally. Second Thessalonians 1 and 9. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power? Think about this for a minute and listen to the words. Now, we're not going to go into an etymology of the words because that's a study in itself. But if you were to break down these words, you'd see what, how it describes hell in a very precise manner of being eternal. And not being a place that you want to be in at all. But listen to what he says so at the very end of that verse. Everlasting, means it doesn't end, destruction, death from the presence of the Lord. Remember while I told you a while ago, God's not there. God is life. He is what maintains the life that we have. His Spirit quickens our spirit, makes our spirit alive. Remember what we read this morning, that without the Spirit, the body is dead. He is the one that maintains life. From the presence of God, out of the presence of God, there is only death and darkness. Okay? So we're from the presence of the Lord and from what? <coughs> the glory of His power. It's through His power, His Word, that He maintains all things. We read that in Colossians. With His Word, He upholds everything. He maintains all creation. All of this will cease. Heavens will be rolled back. This will be scroll and burned up. The earth and the elements thereof, things that are here, physical elements, will be destroyed. What's left? If nothing physical is left, only the eternal, the spiritual is left. Matthew 25, verse 41. Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, 
Remember in the, in the Bible we're told there's two things, two choices we have. We have the choice of the blessing or the choice of the curse. If we choose the curse, we follow the path that leads to the curse, that's what we receive. What is that curse? Torment, punishment, and everlasting torment for a place that was prepared initially for the devil and his angels. Well, that's the curse. Depart from me, you curse it into everlasting fire. Prepared for what? What I just told you, the devil and his angels. That's what hell was prepared for in the first place. Okay? Matthew 25, verse 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. How much more clear can God make it? Everlasting means it's not going to end. Everlasting punishment, but the righteous into what? Eternal life. If heaven is eternal, the consequence of not going to heaven is an eternal choice as well. That's common sense. That's fundamental logic. If one place is eternal, so is the other. Can there be any doubt then that hell, that hell is eternal? God's making it pretty plain, isn't it? Yet the world wants to think of it as not permanent, not, a, not an eternal condition. What they are trying to do is soften the, the consequences of their choice. Yeah, it would be like getting a spanking. Dad, it'll hurt for a little while, but then it'll go away. That's what the world's looking for. So that they can have an excuse and a conscience that's free from the burden of worry for the, the consequences of their choice. That's not the way God wants it. That's not the way it's going to be. The terms used to describe the eternal or eternality of hell are used to also describe the eternality of heaven. God and the eternal life of the saved. The same words are being used. So if we're going to say heaven is not, I'm sorry, that hell's not eternal, it's not really forever, those words that are being used to describe that are the same words to describe our eternal life and the eternity of heaven. If it's not really eternal, eternal for one, then it's not really eternal for all of the others as well. They have to be careful how they pick and they choose, don't they? Okay? Let's look at God, first of all. Okay? Before the mountains were brought forth, or over, or ever, thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. That's in Psalms 90 and verse 2. Psalms 90 and verse 2. Before the earth, before the physical world that we have that He's given us, before it was formed, He existed. He was from everlasting, from eternity to eternity. Right? Christ. About Christ. Was he there in the beginning? Yes, he was. He was with God in the very beginning. He's part of the eternal Godhead. He says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive evermore, forever. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Revelation 1:18. Another one about God in Revelation 5, 14. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped Him that liveth forever and ever. You look up the forever and ever, it's the same words that we use for everlasting. It means for the time set aside for, for eons, for a continuation, never stopping. Okay? It's not hard to understand that. Now about heaven itself. 
Remember, he said, I've gone to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He wants us to be with Him in heaven. If we're going to be there. We'll be able to partake of the tree of life and do in heaven with Him. He will be our God. We will be with Him for all eternity. The Bible tells us all these things. Well, that's the place we call heaven. How long is heaven going to be? Look at Matthew 25 and 46. Matthew 25 and 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Consequences for the choices made in life. Some are going to be punished, some are going to be rewarded. The same duration of time for each. Revelation 22 and verse 5. Revelation 22 and verse 5 says, And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. Same words that are used to describe hell. Punished forever and ever. Having life in heaven forever and ever. Same words. Well, if heaven is eternal and there is no end, using the same terminology, heaven is the same. Uh, and hell is the same because the same words are used. What about saved? Our salvation. John 3.16 we know that first of all. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Everlasting life. Everlasting punishment. Same word. So if it has a time limit on how long hell is going to last, but it would have a time limit on how long life is. You see, the ridiculousness of some in the world trying to say no, that's just for a little while. Well, if they want that eternal life, they want it to go on and on and on. It's the same word. Therefore, it has the same meaning. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. You know this one. Wages of sin, right? Is death. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. The gift is what? Eternal life. It has no end. 1 John chapter 2, verse 25. 1 John 2, 25. And this is the promise that He hath promised us, even eternal life. Same word. If it means eternal here, it means eternal when it's used to describe hell. Because it's the same word. See, when you look at these things and you analyze these things and understand that the consequences of our choice have a gravity of weight that we need to consider. Do I really want to go to heaven? Of course we do. That's why we're here, isn't it? that we need to start making right choices because the consequences of our choice will weigh heavy on eternity. If I want eternal life, but if I don't have eternal life, then I have only one other place to go, and that's eternal punishment. It won't stop. See, that's what the world wants. The world wants an excuse. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have my fun here. I'm going to be punished for a little bit, but it's not going to last very long, and it'll be over. I actually knew a gentleman one time. Nice guy. And he said very clearly, he said, oh, hell, hell's not forever. It'll, oh, I'll be punished for a little bit. And it might hurt a little bit, but that's, once it's over, I'm going to be dead. And I'll be dead just like Robert and all that. 
Those were his exact words. But that's not the case. Remember very clearly, and don't ever forget, God created us, the forms of the dust of the earth, and our bodies shall return to the dust. For dust thou art, dust thou shalt return. But in, when the Lord returns, He will resurrect our body. It will be different. We will have a body like Christ had and after He was resurrected. An eternal body that will not suffer death anymore. Our spirit, the real us that God has given us, that's made in His image, never dies. The spirit, Bible says, clearly returns to God who gave it. You've got to understand, it's not, this physical realm that we're in is not for all eternity. The choices we make while we are here, they decide where eternity will be. And as a spiritual being, I want to be in heaven. I want to live eternally with God. Therefore, I need to look at His Word and understand what His Word is telling me and do what His Word has told me to do. And I will be rewarded for that obedience. And I will be with Him forever in heaven. You need to listen to what He's telling us. If hell is not eternal, beloved, then neither could God, heaven, nor the saved be eternal. If you're looking at this word, these words the way the world wants to, and say, no, it's really not forever, then, beloved, God's not forever. Heaven's not forever, and being eternally saved is not forever. Because it is the exact same words used to describe all of it. God is eternal. God is from everlasting to everlasting. We just read that a moment ago. I choose to believe what the Bible says. I choose not to parse words and decide what I want to believe and what I don't. The Bible is clearly from God. It is the truth, John 17, 17. And 2 Timothy 3, 16 tells us that it's profitable means I gain from studying it, from learning from it, from it teaching me, guiding me, correcting me. Why? It tells you in verse 17, so that I, a child of God, can be thoroughly furnished unto what? All good works. What are those good works? Those are the works and the duties that God has commanded me to do. And when I do those things, I am pleasing to Him. And He blesses me. And ultimate, the ultimate blessing is eternal life with Him in heaven. You cannot pick and choose. That is wrong. God's justice, His righteousness, requires, demands that hell be eternal. First of all, God is just. Therefore, all His judgments are perfect. He doesn't make mistakes. When He judges, He tells us very clearly, My Word will judge man in the last day. In other words, what He's told me is right and wrong is what He's going to use to measure my life by. And His judgments will be perfect because He is. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4. It says, He is the rock. In other words, He's steady, He's firm, He's immovable. His work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment. And God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. Therefore, when He makes determinations, makes judgments, they're perfect. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 21. Isaiah 45 and verse 21. It says, Tell you and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this form from ancient time? 
Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. There are no other gods. There's only one God. And he's declaring that. He's telling you, there's no other God but me. There's no one else you answer to but me. A just God. And a Savior. In other words, he's done what needs to be done for us to have eternal life. And have redemption. Matter of fact, we're even told that the angels desire to look into what we have, but they cannot. There is none beside me. Well, if I take this to be true, and I believe that it is, then God's telling me that He's perfect, He's just, He's righteous. There are no other gods that save Him alone. He created me, He created all that we see. In Revelation, we're told that He was created, that we were created for His pleasure. The Bible continues to tell me that my whole duty, my purpose for being here is to please Him, to fear Him, and obey Him. And my obedience glorifies Him. My praise glorifies Him. And my love pleases Him. And my reward is eternal life in heaven. Not hard to understand. Unless you have a little help. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who are the saints? We are. We are saints in Christ Jesus. We are set apart for Him. He is our King. He is our Master. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is everything to us. And just and true are His ways. Now what kind of justice would it be if the wicked were merely annihilated? Think about that for a moment. What kind of justice would that be? Even as human beings making laws and determinations, we have looked at people and their actions and made, made determinations that some things need to be swift and, and complete, some need to be punished for a little while, but then there are some who deserve a life sentence. So we graduated our punishment, so wouldn't that be logical to think that we would be graduated punishments as well? They would be able to live a life of uh, sin without fear of retribution if, if they were just simply annihilated. I'm going to have my fun now. It will be over before I know it anyway. That's the way they would think. Look at Psalms 10 verse 13. This is what God's talking about in this psalm. Psalms chapter 10 verse 13. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? He hath said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. In other words, they're mocking God. I'm, I'm going to go do what I want to do. You're really not going to do what you say. I'm going to go do what I want to do. And they'll just take, take me out if that's what the case is. And then it'll be over. I like what I told you that man said, well, uh, when I was a boy. Well, I might be punished for a little bit, but it'll be all over then. That's not the case. They would never ultimately be punished for the suffering that was caused in others. Look in Psalms 94, verse 3. If there were no justice, they would not be punished. Psalms 94, verse 3 says, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? Do we see this? We understand that there are many who are wicked out there, and we know that they will be punished. 
We did men like, uh, say, Hitler, for instance, or Stalin, or some of these other bad people that we've heard through the history and through time. They, uh, they would uh, suffer no worse fate than just a regular common person. Okay. Look at Psalms 146 and verse 9. Psalms 146 and verse 9. The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. He's going to punish. There is no alternative. Men cannot just do whatever they want to do and not and expect no consequences. Remember what Paul said, no man liveth unto himself. We all answer to God. No man lives unto himself. You might think I rule my life, I rule what I want to do, and I can I can answer to no man. Well, you will answer to God. Because life is granted by God. God will punish. Some say that eternity in hell is cruel and unusual punishment. Really? Is it? Stop and think for a moment. What I mentioned to you a moment ago. We are not just physical beings. We are spiritual beings. Who are indwelling a physical body for the time moment. And as Paul said, we're pilgrims here for a little while. We are created in the image of God. We will live eternally, beloved. We will be resurrected. Where that eternity is, is what we're deciding here and now. Will it be in heaven with God? Or will it be in a place that originally was designed for the spiritual beings who rebel in heaven? The devil and his angels. See, a spiritual being has to have a spiritual place to be punished. Separated from God. That's where hell will be. We have to understand that. <coughs> who are we? The ones who are guilty of sin to say whether God's punishments are just or not. Who are we to question God and His righteous judgments? We don't have a right to. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our ways. He is true. He is righteous. He is perfect. He is just in all of His ways. Who are we to question whether He's right or wrong in Him? We don't have a right to do so. We must read and understand and believe and trust and know <coughs> His decisions are right. Since we do allow the guilty to, uh, since when do we allow the guilty to decide their fate? Even now we don't do that. The men who have committed crimes, we hold them accountable. We take them to the court, judges, and juries. Even now we don't let them decide their own fate. Why in the world would God? That's what judgment is all about. We will give answer for even every idle word that we speak. Unless we give an account, because we will be judged. We will be judged by a perfect judge who does not make mistakes. Think about it for a moment. It is not an offense against an eternal God, merit, no retribution for such an offense. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 gives you the answer for that. The wages of sin is death. This tells you very clearly that sin is an offense against God. It's trespassing against God's word. We're told what sin is. So, we don't have a right to question God. We certainly don't have the right to 
to manipulate his word and say and can say things that it does not say. Hell is eternal. Just as heaven is eternal. There's always a balance. Always a balance with God. So understanding that hell is eternal and our choices determine whether we go there or not, that changes things, doesn't it? And surely in the world out there where people think that heaven is eternal but hell is not, surely that should weigh heavy on their conscience, realizing that yes, hell is eternal. That should help them to make up their minds, shouldn't it? We would like to think so. Always remember. Always. We are eternal beings. From the very beginning of our life, we were. God gives us our spirit. Our soul is eternal. Let's make the choices in life that help us to gain eternal life with God. Realizing, knowing, believing, and trusting that God is true. With Him there is never a shadow of turning. God will not go back on what He has told us. Heaven is eternal. His will is eternal. It's an everlasting covenant that says, I love you. I forgive you. Welcome into my love. That's what we want to do. Well done, God will be faithful, sir. Enter ye into the rest. What's the rest of heaven? And it's forever. It's eternal. If you're here this evening and you need the prayers of the church, you need anything that we can do for you, and the Lord, we're here for you. We love you. God certainly does, and He wants you to go to heaven. He's prepared an eternal place for you to be. Let us help you make it there. That's why we're here. Let us do whatever we can for you. Once you come, all together we stand in the